Hello and welcome to Bangalore International Center's very own podcast BIC Talks. Bangalore International Center is a platform for informed conversations, exchange of ideas and a space for arts and culture. BIC Talks brings the essence of all that the physical space stands for and more to your doorstep. Hi, I'm Pavan Srinath and welcome to BIC Talks. Today I'm pleased to share this year's Professor Satish Chandra Memorial Lecture by renowned historian Professor Romila Thapar. She'll be speaking on migrations and the making of cultures in early India. This talk was broadcast live as a part of BIC Streams on October 13, 2020. You can catch the full unedited live event on Bangalore International Center's YouTube channel. And I would encourage you to subscribe to the center's newsletter to get notified and be able to register for such live events in the future. Without taking any more of your time, here is Romila Thapar on migrations and the making of cultures in early India. I would like to begin by thanking Mr. Alok Chandra for inviting me to give this memorial lecture in remembrance of his late father. My thanks also go to Professor Mridula Mukherjee. We've had a long innings together, first as uh, your being a student in the center and then as your being a colleague. And it is absolutely delightful for me to have you chair this lecture this evening. Thank you very much for agreeing to do so. I do feel deeply privileged by the invitation to give this year's memorial lecture in memory of the late Professor Satish Chandra. It is a privilege as it gives me yet another chance to honor a person who was not only a fellow historian, but also a much respected colleague. Really the most striking thing about him and a few other historians at that time was the fact that Indian history advanced out of a colonial perspective, out of even some aspects of nationalist historical writing, which was beginning to be questioned at that point. It advanced into a study of a history with a much broader perspective, what we sometimes call interdisciplinary history, but that's a rather narrow way of defining it. And I would say it was, it was the kind of history that he and others of that time initiated, which answered many of the fundamental questions of who we are, what are we doing here, what is our society, what has been our past, how does the past relate to the present? This was a very fundamental question that struck all of us at that time. And we weren't doing it in a kind of automatic way that there is a continuity in chronology and in, in dates and periods and so on. But we were doing it in a much more fundamental way of trying to examine the nature of society in earlier periods and how that links up, if it does, as in many cases it does, with what is happening in the present. In other words, how does one understand the past in terms of its providing some kind of explanation that would help us understand the present? And inevitably, of course, if one understands the present in any kind of intensive analytical way, there is a, the beginnings of an understanding of what the future might hold. So it's this continuity that we were concerned with and, and also the fact of how it interrelated one with the other. And as Mridula has explained, the aspects and themes that he took up were very much the aspects and themes that led into this kind of analysis and made of history a very different kind of discipline from what it had been in the period of 100 years ago. My own specialization is in the early period, what used to be called ancient history, although I take it up a little further into the early second millennium AD. 
Therefore, I shall be touching only partially on medieval times. I always say that I feel most comfortable when I'm talking about the BCs, a little uh, less comfortable when I'm talking about the ADs, but really rather terrified when I move into the second millennium AD, as I shall be just touching this evening. But hopefully that what I may have to say about this very early period will have some resonance with what happened in the history of the later times. I have chosen to speak on the subject of migrants and the making of cultures in India. The choice of subject is in the nature of a plea that historians of India should give more attention to the importance of migrations in the creation of Indian cultures at various historical periods. Many histories treat the role of migration as marginal. This needs correction. If we recognize this role, we will have a better understanding of the cultures that resulted from the interface and give credit to the process. I shall speak of three examples that demonstrate this process. I shall first refer to the migration of the Aryan-speaking people in the second millennium before Christ, BCE. Then I'll move forward a millennium or so in the period of the Kushans in the early centuries AD. And my third example will be from the second millennium AD with the Arab traders from across the Arabian Sea. One of the advantages of dealing with such a long history is that one can happily move from one millennium to another. Let me explain first why I chose these three examples. They are from different periods and they are distinct in terms of who migrated and why. The cultures that they helped to create took recognizably different forms. And we don't often recognize how much of our past we owe to migrant groups. Today, we may call them foreigners, but in earlier times, they were integrated with and contributed to the host culture and its heritage in India, the host culture being India. My examples are from neighboring areas outside the subcontinent. But before I discuss migration, let me clarify one confusion that is commonly made. Migration should not be mistaken for invasion. The two must be differentiated and the difference made clear. Among the features of an invasion, invasion, are that every invasion can be dated to a specific point in time We always talk about the invasion taking place in a particular year. The invasion always involves a large body of trained and armed soldiers who use the maximum violence to conquer and loot the region that they attack. If they are victorious and decide to settle in the area, they take over its governance and appropriate its revenue. The cultural distinction between the local and the foreign is determined by the nature of the invasion and governance. It can merge into a continuation from the past with a minimal change, or it can be strikingly different. Migration by contrast is entirely different in its historical impact. It is not a uniform process for all times. Each one differs defined by who came from where and why and where did they settle. It involves many people who move from one geographical area to another in small groups at a leisurely pace with the intention of settling in the new geographical area to which they move. Migrations from and to broadly the same areas are known to have continued for sometimes a century or even more in small dribs and drabs, as it were. Migrants transported some of their goods and their chattel, and this showed 
slowed down their movement, often halting temporarily en route. The new settlement was permanent. It could therefore be accommodated or contested by previous inhabitants. This was not on the scale of an invasion. Migrants, unlike soldiers, generally do not return to their original homeland. Migrations do not become invasions, and invasions can at most indicate the potential for migration. Forms of migration differ enormously, but the two very common ones in many parts of the world, two categories of pre-modern times, were pastoralists and traders. Pastoralists moved when their grazing grounds dried up or when others displaced them from their space. The movement of pastoralists was slow since animal herds often moved along with the herders. <clears throat> the route they chose had to have pa pastures along the way so that the animals could be fed. If there were settled societies en route, then negotiations could be required between the two and adjustments made to a new environment. Pastoral migrants look for familiar ecologies and areas of low population density. This was, of course, not a problem in ancient times. The search for pastures discouraged congregating in one place and migrants needed to fan out. Often the spreading took the form of a small group branching off and founding a new settlement. And this pattern was repeated again and again. The diversity in their patterns of living often reflect the diversity of local cultures indicating where they had settled. Peasants by contrast seldom migrate. Being more rooted in the small areas that they cultivate, they tend on the whole not to migrate. Some references are made in the early texts to discontented peasants suffering from heavy taxation, leaving their land and migrating next door to the neighboring kingdom. And we're told that the kings always feared this because it meant a loss of revenue. The other group that I want to talk about that often migrated over long distances were, of course, traders, but in much smaller numbers than the pastoralists. Those that settled in a new place where there was a potential for trade were treated as migrants. However, depending on the items traded, they were required sometimes to retain contact with their homeland. This encouraged another difference from the pastoral pattern. Migrant traders often had partners in the host country, and these in turn could become migrants, setting, settling in the area from which the migrant trader had come. For instance, when the trade with Central Asia became sizable, cities like Bukhara had specific mohallas, neighborhoods, where the Indian traders resided. And these mohallas are still pointed out when one goes to visit the cities. Thus, if correctly understood, patterns of migration introduce a new dimension to cultural interaction making an impact on many patterns of living. This is central to the definition of cultural tradition. Historians these days are arguing that what we call tradition is invented and whenever required, and it is then legitimized by trying to find origins in the early past. But the inventions of patterns of living pick up items of belief and practice that come from many sources, including from groups that have migrated into an area and settled there. And this is an aspect that does need investigating. What is likely to be affected first is, of course, language. 
if the two languages of the migrant and the host society differ, as they frequently do, then one of them is adopted, or alternately, a mixed language emerges from the currency of two languages. The next step is for the migrant society to establish its status. If the migrants introduce a new and superior technology, as sometimes happens, then that influences status. Intermarriage is another method, and it is surprising how much intermarriage did take place despite the rules that question it. And the third visible indicator is religion, as seen in changing forms, practices, sacred spaces, texts, icons, and so on. The question then is, do the cultures remain distinctive, or is there a mutual incorporation of selected observances to a greater or lesser degree? It is at this point that identity becomes crucial. Language, social status, and religion contribute towards creating an identity. Does the emerging society declare itself as distinct and separate, or else does it get inducted into the host society, and thus a new community emerges from the interface? Identities, as we know, are consciously constructed and are multiple. And this multiplicity is apparent in history, even if we try and ignore it. Now, keeping all this in mind, let me turn to my examples. Going back to earliest times, evidence from Harappan sites suggested the possibility of small-scale migrations, but the evidence is ambiguous. We have much more data about the subsequent migration, that of the Aryan-speaking agro-pastoralists, moving from the Oxus region, just to the north of the mountains, the northern mountains of India, into northern India. Some today regard this as a controversial statement, since they maintain that there was no migration and that the Aryan speakers were indigenous to the subcontinent. But amongst most scholars who have researched the subject, there is a consensus on migration, not on invasion, but on migration. A century ago, the sources of this period were limited to the Vedic texts. But we now have to consider many uh, other sources and much more information. Among them, for instance, are the geographical and archaeological distribution beyond India of other Indo-European speakers, therefore related linguistically to the Indo-Aryan. Also, the data from linguistics on the structure of the Indo-Aryan language is important and revealing. And then the very recent evidence that everybody is very excited about, which is now surfacing, is that through the study of DNA and genetics. But the controversy does not affect what I have to say, which is the question of the juxtaposition of cultures. So I will set that controversy aside. I will instead speak of what these many sources tell us and how they introduce new aspects of this prolonged discussion. The culture of Vedic society in Northern India was something of an innovation. The previous Harappan culture was very different. The geographical area of the Harappa culture was extensive from the Pamis to Gujarat, taking in the entire Indus plain, the entire Indus system, in fact, and across the Gulf to Oman, with some contacts extending to Mesopotamia. Not sites, but contacts. Viewed from the Indus plain, it was essentially an activity 
focusing on areas to the south and the west of the Indus area. When we turn to the Rig Veda, the earliest Vedic composition, we find that it was unfamiliar with the larger part of this area, focusing only on the upper Indus, the Punjab, and the upper Doab. The subsequent Vedic texts look only eastwards from the Punjab into the Ganges plain, a direction opposite to the spread of the Harappa culture. There is a beautiful and graphic description in the Shatapada Brahmana of the migration eastwards of Aryan speakers from the Doab to the Middle Ganges plain. It is said that the leader of this migration carried Agni in his mouth, which I think is a remarkable symbolism of all kinds of possibilities. The geographical starting point of the Indo-Aryan culture would be the area known to the Rig Veda. Were there any antecedents? There is the intriguing relationship of Indo-Aryan, the language of the Rig Veda, with Old Iranian, the language of the earliest gathas of the Avastha, connected to northeastern Iran. Cultural affinity is suggested by the closeness of the two languages, by the worship of Mitra and Varuna, the earlier deities of the Rig Veda, and at least one important ritual, the Soma sacrifice, which is, however, limited to just these two cultures and is not found in other Indo-European cultures. Therefore, there are divergences, but very many similarities also in the old Iranian and Indo-Aryan cultures. And we have to still work out the relationship between them. The Avasta recalls a migration stage by stage from Central Asia to what they call the Hapta Hindu, the Sapta Sindhu, India, the Indus. But what about the language picture in these times? The Rig Veda again marks a differentiation between the Aryas who speak the language of the hymns and others such as the Dasas and the Dasyus who seem not to do so. Those who cannot speak the language are referred to as the Mlecha. And typically the Mlecha, we are told, confuse the R and the L sound. Interestingly, this persists for many centuries and is found in a few inscriptions of Ashok Maurya, where he is referred to sometimes as Laja Magade instead of Raja Magade. Linguistics informs us of certain characteristic elements of the Dravidian languages that also appear in Indo-Aryan. For example, the inclusion of retroflex sounds. This is historically well worth noting because it occurs only in Indo-Aryan and not in other related languages of the larger Indo-European family. Similarly, Indo-Aryan alone borrows some vocabulary from Dravidian. The evidence from a comparative study of the two languages suggests that the Aryan speakers lived in the proximity of speakers of Dravidian and other languages. There are references to the Aryavarna and the Dasavarna. We know about the culture of the Arya, but the Dasa remains enigmatic. The Dasas are culturally differentiated. The terms used to describe them, such as a manusha, implicitly sets them apart. They are called a deva, without recognizable gods, and are said to be phallic worshippers. Of course, their language is also not the same. So a question that is being asked these days is whether they could have been the lesser post Harappan 
communities. Nevertheless, some of them are wealthy with large herds of cattle. Cattle raids are very frequent at this time, cattle being an item of wealth. The Aryas were associated with the horse, a much revered animal for them. And the identity of the Dasa is difficult to determine at this point. In the subsequent period, Dasa refers to subservient groups as Dasas and Dasis. These were generally the impoverished or low status people in servile occupations. And the more impoverished among them were inevitably the women. When wealth is counted, the list includes cattle, horses, and dasis, among other things like gold and chests of this, that, and the other. This is also linked to a small but puzzling category of people described as Brahmins who are the sons of Dasis. One would expect such Brahmins to have a low status, and indeed that is what is said of them in one story. But the story has its own interest. It narrates that the Brahmins, when conducting a ritual of sacrifice, objected to the presence of a Dasi Putra because of his low status. The Dasi Putra then recited an appropriate mantra and prayed to the gods, and the river Saraswati began to follow him. So the Brahmins realized that he cannot be dismissed, and they invited him to join them and became appropriately deferential. A few of the respectable sages also of these texts are said, said to have been sons of Dasis. Among them, the very famous one, which was mentioned in the Upanishads, uh, Satyakama Jabala. So these were Brahmins born of Dasi mothers and presumably had Brahman fathers, and that would have allowed them Brahman status. If so, then it suggests that the more highly accomplished members of this mixed community could be incorporated into the community of Aryan speakers and given high status. This might explain the intermeshing of languages. In some ways, this pattern appears to parallel what is being suggested in the genetic analysis of the DNA data from Harappan and post-Harappan sites, still in its preliminary stages, the examination of the data. The reading so far is that the Harappan data points to the presence of indigenous hunter-gatherers together with farmers from Iran, with no evidence of people from Central Asia. But in the post-Harappan period, that is around 4,000 years or so before the present, there is additionally a presence from Central Asia. What the genetic data suggests is a large admixture of populations in the ancestry of Indians. And in this, we are no different from any other major cultures elsewhere in the world. One of the things that genetic analyses are teaching us is that there is no such thing as absolute purity of descent. We are all hopelessly mixed. If we combine all these sources, what do they tell us about migration and culture? The settlements in the Sapta Sindhu region, the northern Indus, the upper Indus region, settlements of those who called themselves Aryas, meaning the respected people, appear to be in proximity to people who are labeled as Dasas and from whom the Aryas differentiate themselves. What were the elements of this interface? Migration meant some adjustment in their earlier culture when adapting to a new environment and possibly new people. 
Is there an intermingling of cultures? This happens sometimes when, after the harvest is cut, farmers invite pastoralists to let their animals graze on the stubble in the fields. And through this process, the fields are more easily made ready for the next crop, and animal droppings add manure to the fields. This is what is sometimes called symbiosis. And it leads to a closer interdependence between the two, the pastoralist and the farmer. If the migrants come with a better technology, such as horse-driven chariots and the use of iron in place of bronze technology, they have an edge over the locals. In the intertwining of cultures, many factors are involved. Historians today are less concerned with the question of the origin of the Aryans and much more concerned with how the cultures which they gave rise to actually evolved. We therefore have to ask what other elements contributed to the making of these cultures that emerged. The language may mutate. New mixed social identities take shape and religious forms relate to some old and some new features. My second example is from the same area of Central Asia and Northern India, but a millennium later. The frequency of migrations strengthened the links between the two regions. Both migrants and the host cultures amidst which the migrants settled provide sources of this. The type of migration in this example differed from the first. These who came now were initially pastoralists, but who had gradually become traders. This was almost a typical pattern in Central Asia. It encouraged traders to settle in India and traders from India, the host country, to settle in the locations from which the migrant traders had come. Chinese texts describe many nomadic pastoral clans of Central Asia located to the northwest of China in areas adjoining Xinjiang and also around the Taklamakan and the Gobi deserts. The more powerful of these were the Xiongnu, who had immense conflicts with the Yueshi, each anxious to control more pastures. The Yueshi being ousted, they migrated slowly westwards to the Oxus region to Bactria. Again, the region just north of the northern Indian mountains. A section of the Yueshi, the Kushans, were more ambitious. They extended their control southwards to the upper Indus area, including Gandhar, and further into northern India as far as the Ganges plain. Initially, this was a pastoral migration, followed by the Kushan conquest and eventually by trade. And as the groups moved south of the Oxus, they met others also linked to the same region, namely the Indo-Greeks, the Shakas, the Parthians, who had ruled the area of the Upper Indus and Gandhar and Bactria prior to the Christian era. These were replaced by the Kushans taking over authority. And gradually the area changed from the dominance of migrant peasant communities to becoming a sedentary state with settled communities and finally forming a substantial commercial hub. How is this made possible? The Kushans brought with them a major item that went back to their pastoral days, but which they converted very cleverly into a commercial asset. This was the Central Asian horse. The horse became crucial to armed warfare 
as in the cavalry and the chariot wings of the army. This made it a prized item in commerce, both with China and India, competing to import horses. China, in turn, produced endless bolts of the luxury item, silk. So trade began with a preliminary system of what is called gift exchange. That is, presenting one party, presenting gifts as part of a formal, almost diplomatic exchange to the other. The Chinese presented bolts of silk, which they were producing in vast quantities, to the aggressive pastoral clans in order to pacify them. The pastoralists, in turn, supplied the Chinese with horses. This eventually led to complex trade connections and in other items as well, and over very long distances from the eastern parts of Central Asia to the western areas of Bactria, the Oxus, and even further west. Spices, cotton textiles, carved ivory items, and pearls were exported from India. Glassware and gems came in large quantities from Europe, not to mention, of course, the amphorae of wine and oil. This ensured wealth for all uh, who were involved in the trade, and its success was recognized in the circulation of gold coins. Erstwhile pastoralists became transporters and eventually participants in the trade. And by the early centuries AD, the demand for silk was enormous from the Roman Empire, as was the demand for horses from India and China. The silk routes were just buzzing with activity. Kushan presence in the Northwest coming as far as the Ganges Plain, had its focus in Mathura. This suggests that controlling trade routes was more lucrative than merely territory. The objects from excavated sites that have emerged in large numbers reflect a new commercial culture in which the erstwhile migrant groups are recognizably present. The three indices of culture that I referred to earlier changed in this region. A change of language is indicated in Kushan inscriptions. Alexander's campaign earlier had opened up the Oxus Plain to settlers from the Hellenistic Greek kingdoms of West Asia. Greek was therefore the preferred language. But the Kushan king Kanishka adopted the Bactrian language instead, perhaps because it was used by the prestigious Sasanian power in neighboring Persia. What did this change of language imply? It had an effect, an influence on a change in northern India. The replacing of Greek with Bactrian was to assert Kushan authority, but Kanishka did not introduce Bactrian into India. He patronized the local Indian languages. And curiously, the early use of high quality Sanskrit for royal inscriptions is associated with the Shaka ruler, Rudradaman. Sanskrit now became the language of most royal inscriptions. It was already the language of learning, but this was a new use it was put to. Language was tied to claims of status, as in the titles taken by these kings, such as Maharaj, Rajati Raj, Devaputra, Kushan. This was a substantial claim by erstwhile pastoralists and reflects their now becoming rooted and powerful in Sanskrit using areas. Nevertheless, the migrant identity was not entirely forgotten. It is interesting that in the 11th century AD, the historian Kalhana, uh, writing the history of Kashmir, the Raja Tarangani, describes the Kushans as Turushkas, Turks, 
thereby associating them with Central Asia. Trade opens up the regions and other aspects of life are also affected. In the early centuries AD, Bactria and Gandhar became focal centers of interchange in religious movements. I would like to draw attention to two connected to India, one more local and the other that swept across Asia. To start with the first, the worship of the goddess was extensive in this area of Central Asia and the preeminent goddess was Nana. Her status was raised when the Kushan kings became her patrons and linked her to kingship and power. Her icons showed her riding a lion. In India too, goddesses were commonly worshipped, as was Durga. The question, however, is whether the Kushan version of Nana was linked to depicting the power of Durga by making the lion her mount. It is intriguingly said of Durga in some few texts that she is also worshipped by various lich clans. The more impressive cultural impact of the Kushans was their being a conduit for the spread of a new form of Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism. This had its genesis in the area held by the Kushans. A number of features new to Buddhism were introduced. The Buddha acquired elements of divinity and his image began to be worshipped. The icon tended to take on the features of the people who were worshipping it. Bodhisattvas now entered the Buddhist narrative, and these were there to help those seeking nirvana. Buddhist texts were written in the local version of Prakrit, Gandhari Prakrit, and in Sanskrit. Buddhism had always been strengthened by the powerful institution of the monasteries, now accompanying the establishment of Buddhism outside India. Buddhist monks traveled with the traders from India to oases towns in Central Asia, such as Kucha and Dunhuang, and from there, some continued into China. Mahayana Buddhism reached out to both the pastoral communities and the traders. But by the late first millennium AD, Buddhism was the significant religion in Central Asia, Eastern Asia, and Southeastern Asia. This incidentally was also the period when it was being slowly edged out of India, barring in a few places. My third example is of migrants from an altogether different geographical region who came as traders. The cultural change can often be more evident in the new communities that they create rather than in the host society. This often happened along the west coast of India that constantly received migrant traders. Throughout the centuries, the Arabian Sea has connected Southern Arabia, the Red Sea, and East Africa with the littoral of Western Asia. Let me say one thing in connection with maritime history and Indian Ocean history that Professor Satish Chandra was so interested in. Seas were always treated as areas of distancing in fact, they're very often areas of people coming together. And this is a very interesting aspect of the history of the world. In the period around the Christian era, trade was a source of impressive wealth with investments from Eastern Mediterranean merchants. The Roman Empire declined, but this trade witnessed the growing participation of West Asian traders. Arab presence in places along the west coast is recorded from the 9th century AD. A Rashtrakuta inscription states that the Tajik Arab governor of Samyan, Sanjan, 
the area north of Mumbai, was a man named Madhumati, which is a Sanskritized form of Muhammad. He granted a village and some land to a Brahman in order that the Brahman maintain a temple dedicated to the goddess Bhagwati Devi. This is a neat interlink of an Arab governor working for the Rashtrakuta kings, making a substantial grant to a Brahman for maintaining a temple dedicated to a goddess. Another point of interest is that the location, this particular location, was linked to a Parsi Anjuman in Sanjar. Zoroastrian traders had migrated from Persia from about the 8th century onwards and settled in this part of the west coast. They were the ancestors of the present Parsi community. Tradition has it that the migration was of Zoroastrians escaping from having to convert to Islam. But curiously, they chose to settle in Sanjan and in the vicinity of a town with a sizable population of Arab traders. There is no reference to hostility for that the attraction of lucrative trade also brought the Persian migrants. They spoke the local language, Gujarati. And as we know today, there is a special kind of Gujarati, which is actually referred to as Parsi Gujarati, which is different from the other. They spoke Gujarati. They were encouraged to adopt the local marriage rules, but this did not include caste. They maintained their own forms of worship, and they were required to abjure violence. This was a case of the migrants retaining their belief systems, but foregoing their language. However, this was not the pattern for all migrant traders on the West Coast. Those that did mix and merge with local communities, including through intermarriage, often assimilated cultural facets from them. And this gave rise to new identities. A number of Arab traders settled in the coastal areas from Kerala to Gujarat and in, in their interaction with local communities gave rise to new communities such as the Mapilas, the Navayats, the Bohras and the Kojas and such like. These areas were familiar to the reach of trade across the Arabian Sea. It went back many centuries to maritime trade between coastal India and the states across. The island of Socotra, for example, was a central hub, as was Yemen a little later. The traders as migrants were making existing ties stronger by settling the, in the areas with which they traded. The languages of these migrant communities differed since the areas where they settled had different languages, Gujarati, Konkani, Malayalam, and so on, each of which the migrants made their own. In the process, the use of Arabic became more marginal. The name Bohara, for instance, comes from the Gujarati word for trade, Bebohara. The communities that emerged acquired differentiated identities that drew on the cultures of existing local communities. But they also had some connections with Yemen and East Africa. Distinctive identities were expressed in distinctive forms of belief and worship that drew both from the religions of their homeland and of the places where they settled. The Bohoras and Kojas of Gujarat were recognizably different from, for example, the Mapilas of Kerala, because the local Indian identities differed. Despite the Arab ancestry, their religious identities also differed from the conventional Islamic identity, such as that of the Turks and the, and the Afghans, nor indeed were the Hindu elements in their religion identical 
with the conventional ones. There is a very moving inscription from Saurashtra, a memorial inscription, in memory of Bohra Muhammad, who died defending Somnath against the attack of a Delhi Sultan. The early Khojas combined beliefs from Vaishnava and Sufi traditions. Somewhat like the Bhakti tradition, they also had poems and hymns that were popularly sung. They were contributing to the exploration of belief systems or what one might describe as the mixing and matching of religious ideas that has been so characteristic of the history of every religion in India. This changed in modern times when with the sharper definition of formal religions, those with flexible identities had to choose between the two major ones. I have spoken about aspects of migration in pre-modern times, but I would like to conclude by pointing out that this was a world of long ago and even the connotation of migration has been changing in our times. The meaning of migration changed in colonial times and the process was altered out of all recognition. It now involved colonial authority organizing the transportation, mostly involuntary or through capture, of men and women from one part of the world to another distant part from which they could rarely or never return home. The purpose was to use them as forced labor, as slaves or near slaves, living in impoverished conditions and constantly under the threat of death. Needless to say, these were colored peoples, mainly Asians and Africans. They were visibly different from the white settlers who came largely voluntarily as free men to work and own the land that they settled on, the settler societies. This category had some touch of the migrant of earlier times. The world they were all sent to was newly conquered by Europe, where after decimating the original inhabitants, the new arrivals, if white, found a future, and if colored, were put to labor. For the latter, migration became a polite word for forced labor. The meaning of the term migrant was infused with colonial connotations. There were some minor migrations within countries from one area to another but nothing that really changed the cultures of the different societies involved. The change from colony to nation state meant defining national boundaries. These were basic to giving a physical reality to what otherwise has been described by some as imagined communities. The roaming migration of pastoralists became impossible. Earlier trade connections had been broken, with Asia divided up between diverse colonial powers who alone controlled the economy. By the time that ex-colonies became independent nation states, many among them had internalized the identities of race, language, and religion that they had accepted from colonial readings of their pasts. Hence, the history of the word migration is now seeing another turn of meaning in the context of nation states. It has become a qualifier for exclusion in European and Asian nation states, where exclusion may be defined by a supposed race or by religion and doubtless by much else. The precisely defined clear cartographic boundary lines enclosing territory 
is now a major identifier. It is no longer the rather casual and somewhat fuzzy frontier zones of earlier times. But the contradiction is that history also makes it quite apparent that there have been few, if any, permanent boundary lines in the past. These change constantly. Societies that have experienced centuries of history have had to internalize change at many levels. Civilization in itself is a process by which the porosity of societies leading inevitably to a cultural mix is apparent. Societies with an ancient past such as ours have in particular to try and understand how those from the other side of the deserts, the mountains, the forests, the seas, and immersed in diverse cultures were assimilated into our cultures. Similarly, how and why did so many people from our subcontinent travel to distant places in Asia and settle into other societies, creating together with them new cultural identities. It seems to me that what history is telling us is that recognizing the presence of migrants and the cultures that evolve from this presence is part of the process of recognizing and defining who we are. Thank you. Thank you for listening in till the end. Please share this episode with a friend on social media, WhatsApp or anywhere else. It would mean the world to us. And in case you're listening via iTunes or Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and a review. Subscribe to BIC Talks on email or your favorite podcast app and don't miss out on future episodes. This episode of BIC Talks has Gaurav Krishna as our sound engineer with support from S. Sarvanaraj and Lekha Naidu. And the accompanying episode artwork was made by Chandni Venkataraman. Thank you for listening to this episode of BIC Talks. This podcast can be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org, as well as on any of your favorite podcast platforms. Tune in for new episodes every week. And do subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow our Facebook, Twitter and Instagram pages to stay informed on our latest updates.